Now, the European question is very interesting because Europe has detached from uh, the fluoride uh, being necessary for, for teeth and, and caries and dental health because of their own studies and they did independent studies so they've detached from the American paradigm and that's where it started in America it filtered through to all of the coalition of the willing countries such as Australia and Singapore and New Zealand and the UK these are the countries mainly that are fluoridating now it's actually the minority of countries on the planet you'll get very few countries in Asia apart from Singapore which is very westernized using fluoride in their water in particular India. India has had huge problems with fluoride in the bore water causing bone crippling and we recently had uh, Dr. Shashila come out from India on a tour trying to educate doctors and people in how and the dangers of fluoride. You know we, we do have information out there we have massive amounts of studies that have been done conclusively to show the toxicity of fluoride no one is measuring how much is being consumed and there's a huge disconnect. Clearly something has to be done uh, uh, to, to stop the poisoning. At least we need someone to stand up and say, we need an investigation. We need someone to study how much fluoride we're consuming on average. How much is in the food? How much is in the water? How much are babies consuming? We need to find out what the level is that we're consuming to be able to know if it's safe or not. They don't know. Have there any studies been done in Australia that you know of? To show how much we're consuming? No. It's all second-hand information and assumptions. And the assumptions still being maintained in Australia is that one ppm is, you know, one gram per kilo. That's uh, like, you know, they're assuming people only have one or two glasses of water a day to drink to get that amount of fluoride, which is acceptable to them. They don't know. They haven't measured everything that's consumed. So I think this is a huge gap in, uh, in, in very negligent by the Australian government and the health department not to, to pursue this, particularly because it was recommended by the NHMRC some years ago that we should have a study to measure fluoride consumption. That's good. So, uh, would you actually say that we're medically backwards if we uh, go against fluoridation? Well, yes. You know what? We are very medically backwards. And we're scientifically backwards. And I would even call it religious. Because what we're expected to, to do is believe something someone's invented with no science backup, ignoring all the facts of the toxicity. And if you're, you're supposed to believe something and ignore all the data and all the facts, then that to me is a religion. I don't want to base my life on a religious belief. I want the real science. I want the facts. I want this country, I want the Australian government to commission an independent study, not funded by Colgate or any of the chemical companies or the companies making a profit, from the fluoride, the phosphate, the chemicals. None of those companies should be involved. It should be an independent commission, a study which is completely detached and autonomous to really look into the science, how much we are consuming, how much is in the food and the water and the pharmaceuticals, so we actually know how much we're getting. Otherwise, it's all based on assumption. And the risks of getting too much fluoride are so huge that it cannot be ignored. I'm just going to go back one little step. I just noticed something you said. It may have been a mistake, so I'll just ask you a question. Just briefly uh, clarify. Uh, one part per million is not one gram a kilogram. It's one milligram. milligram. Yes, I'm sorry, milligram. Great. You're right. Yes. yes, thank you. Just so that the viewing audience can make sure that they get that. So yes. that's, you're saying, one milligram per litre of water? Per litre. And so... Uh, there are many people that drink much, much more than that. And that's only looking at the water consumption mm -hmm. and not the food and the other sources that we also get fluoride from. I mean, you, now that they're dosing the water supply, you can't go to a restaurant without drinking a cappuccino and it's made with fluoridated water. Okay. When they cook meals with water, they make a pasta. The pasta sauce, uh, the water evaporates. 
that concentrates the fluoride more. It doesn't evaporate so you the same. So you shouldn't boil fluoride? You, you, well, with chlorine, you can boil the water and, and it evaporates and you can cleanse the water that way. But once you fluoridate it, all you do by boiling it is concentrate the fluoride even more in what's left. You sell magnesium products as a family business. What got you interested in magnesium and how it relates to Australia? Well, in my, in my readings, I found that Australia has one of the lowest magnesium contents in the soil in the world. And so where we, we uh, grow our foods, the majority of the food you buy in the supermarkets, the soils are highly depleted, not only because we have an old continent with, with older soil and depleted topsoil, but the farming methods, the chemical farming method, methods using phosphate fertilizers actually don't put a lot of the good minerals back in, in particular magnesium. So if it's not in the soil, the plants can't uptake it. So um, there have been studies done which show different countries and the level of magnesium in the soil and correlating them with the level of degenerative disease and you'll find a seesaw effect that the higher the level of magnesium in the soil, the lower the amount of degenerative diseases in the population and vice versa, the lower the magnesium, the higher the rate of degenerative disease. And that's what we find in Australia. We're nearly top of the list in heart disease, cancer, immune system disorders. Uh, and that is directly related to the amount of the mineral magnesium we're getting because magnesium is a cell protector. We cannot live without magnesium. It's responsible directly in 350 different biochemical processes and indirectly in thousands more because it supports enzyme activity. And so if you have low magnesium, you're much more prone to the toxic effects of chemicals like fluoride. It's going to stay in your body longer, cause more havoc, more damage. The body needs to expel things like fluoride but can't do it sufficiently unless it has enough magnesium. So I thought to myself, well, you, the politicians don't listen. They're still dosing the water with this poison. The, the people don't want it. So what can an individual do to protect themselves and their family? Well, you know, they can put a fluoride filter in, reverse osmosis or buy bottled water or, you know, use distilled water and a few other different methods. But that's only addressing the water that they drink. What about the food and the other things? In a, You can't stop going to a restaurant because you want to avoid the fluoridated water. I mean, you would have to live such a... A, a, a Spartan lifestyle that it, that it would take away from some of the joys of life and I thought well you know inadvertently we're all going to be exposed to some extent no matter how much we try of the fluoride because it's everywhere now and I thought well how can we protect ourselves better and that would that is to lift the magnesium level in the body so I researched magnesium compounds because there are many different kinds and the body can uh, break up some magnesium compounds much better than others and assimilate it and take it up into the cells. And the one that seems to be most bioavailable is magnesium chloride, particularly that derived from naturally evaporated seawater because it's also buffered by natural sea trace minerals that are in the water. And it's also easily able to be taken up transdermally, that is absorbed through the skin, and there have been studies done such as by Dr. Norman Shealy, who found that in four weeks of foot soaking with the magnesium in the patients that were tested, 75% showed a significant increase in intracellular magnesium. And that's very important because most of the magnesium in the body is in the tissue cells and only 1% is in the blood. So taking a blood sample doesn't give you an accurate idea of how much magnesium you have. So they actually measured tissue cells and intracellular magnesium, which is the important part. And so that's only in four weeks. So had they have measured it for longer, that percentage would have kept going up because some people will have a more rapid absorption rate, some people will be a bit slower uh, with the absorption rate. We're all very different and the level of magnesium uh, needs actually falls in a spectrum in the population. 
According to a lot of the researchers in magnesium and the doctors, the average tends to need five to 600 milligram of magnesium supplementation a day. But at the high end, you couldn't get 900 and 1,000 milligram need because over 10% of the population have a gene which causes us to lose excessive magnesium. Then you have stress which causes you to lose excessive magnesium. Um, you have dietary needs that are different people recovering from illness, um, all of those things will require various amounts of magnesium and so you never know how much someone, an individual is going to need but through the skin is very safe, you can just experiment. The body will take what it needs from the surface of the skin when it reaches saturation, it switches that mechanism off at that time then it doesn't absorb anymore and the good part is it only absorbs the pure uh, elemental magnesium ions uh, there is no digestion involved and it is immediately taken up very efficiently. So it's safe, there are no contraindications and everything about transdermal absorption of magnesium really appealed to me. And, and the fact is it's cheap, uh, relatively cheap. People can take a proactive stance with their health to protect themselves and their family. It's something that's easy to do. You can sprinkle some in the bath when your children are having a bath. Have a foot soak in front of the television while you're sitting in the lounge chair. Uh, put your moisturiser on where we have a special magnesium moisturiser infused with the magnesium. Um, there are many opportunities to absorb magnesium through the skin. Provide as much as your body is going to need. Let your body decide what it needs to take up. You don't need to decide how much is enough as long as you make it available every day because the body consumes magnesium every day. And I jump to that uh, for what you've just said about how the body absorbs uh, magnesium. I have a, an interrelationship question. Fluoride, magnesium and iodine. Could you please explain for our viewers the relationship of those three? Well, magnesium and fluoride are antagonists and they compete for the same cell receptor sites. So I liken them to the magnesium, like in the old cowboy movies, the, the cowboy with the white hat, the good guy, the fluorides, the cowboy with the black hat, the bad guy, and they're fighting over the same thing. They, they, the, they, they try and compete for the same cell receptor sites. In the absence of magnesium, if the white guy, white hat guy is not there, the body will accept the black hat as, a, as an imposter, as a counterfeit. Um, and so when fluoride and calcium get together in the bones, it creates a brittle honeycomb structure. And so you can easily break something if you fall with that kind of a crystalline structure in the bones. The bone matrix isn't really forming properly when it has fluoride instead of magnesium. But if magnesium couples with the calcium in the bones, then the bones become really strong and flexible so that you don't suddenly break if you just fall over. Uh, the magnesium gives us the flexibility and the bounce that we need in the bone. It sits inside the softer part of the bone and the magnesium then helps to make the harder side on the outside of the bone and together they make a really strong healthy bone but not the fluoride. And in all the studies they've done they found that the um, uh, fluoridated communities actually have a higher rate of hip fracture than non-fluoridated communities. And this will be because of the fluoride component causing havoc in the bones, especially in the absence of magnesium where the fluoride then becomes more toxic. Now, interestingly enough, when you have low magnesium, you'll also absorb other heavy metals without the body being able to cleanse them out the way they should. And when you have uh, substances such as lead and and aluminium combining with the fluoride, it doesn't become twice as bad, it can become 10,000 times as bad because of the inter in interactions with the heavy metals.